Okay, good evening fellow Earthlings, this is Mr. Abe from the Southern Utah Mobile Planetarium and Ashcroft Observatory. Uh, in today's episode, we're going to be covering deep sky objects, or DSOs, particularly a few entries in the Messier catalog, or M objects. Now, Charles Messier was a French astronomer who really his lifelong passion, his lifelong uh, goal was to discover a comet. He never did though. Um, what he did in trying to discover a comet, because that was like the thing that you could that you could get really famous for at the time as an astronomer, um, but what he did was made a big long list of objects that are not comets, of uh, red herrings per, per se. And he actually got more famous for that list of objects that aren't comets than most astronomers that ever discovered comets. Probably the exception being, you know, Halley, like Halley's Comet. Um, so we're gonna we're just gonna look at a few specific objects here in sort of detailing the life of a star. So we've we, you know we've seen a lot of stars here, right? But I'm going to zoom in on the Orion Nebula, or the Great Orion Nebula, which is what's known as a stellar nursery, and you can actually find this in the night sky. There's the Orion constellation, is down as, as part of his, uh, his sword here, hanging on his belt is the Orion Nebula, and sort of bluish shape, and you can actually see, as we zoom in here, the stars in and surrounding the nebula are all sort of blue colored. Now the reason for that is that they're young stars. See, a nebula is just a fancy word for space cloud. It's a really big cloud of gas in just free-floating molecules out in deep space. The denser pockets of the gas cloud just sort of all smoosh together into stars over long periods of time. And I'm, I'm giving a very brief and non-detailed description of this. They just sort of squish together and turn into stars and other objects over long periods of time. The, a good rule of thumb, I guess, is that blue, blue stars are young stars, red stars are old stars. So there's a lot of blue stars here in the Orion Nebula, which is part of the reason that we can be pretty darn sure that it is a stellar nursery or star-forming region. Now, stars, uh, you know, they've got life cycles, like kind of like we do. They're born, they live, they get old, and then they die. So let's take a look at the Ring Nebula. So this here is what's going to happen, is a similar event to what's going to happen to our Sun in a few billion years. Uh, this is a um, planetary nebula, is what this one's called. It's a remnant of an exploded star. Now you can see it's just sort of sort of popped out in a spherical shape here, right? And uh, made this this very pretty nebula it looks like a like an eye looking back at you, right? Or a ring, which is where it got its name. But you can also see in the very middle there, there's a little white point. Now in the middle is what was left behind, which is a white dwarf star, which is just a very dense, very hot, very quickly spinning sort of star that gets left behind by these sorts of explosions. And for reference, it's about on the scale of the size of the Earth, or even smaller, like the size of the Moon. Uh, except it's much more dense, it's got much more mass. It's got about, about the mass of the whole star, or a large portion of the mass of a whole star. So many thousands many hundreds of thousands, probably, times the mass of the Earth compacted in, in the size of about the same. But what happens to really big stars? Because as we know, Earth, our, our Sun, 
our sun is not a very big star. So what happens with the very big stars? And M1, the first object in the Messier catalog, and the other ones that I just went through are also objects in the Messier catalog, um, but this is the first entry here, is the Crab Nebula. And this is a supernova remnant. This is what happens when a really big star explodes. It just sort of, first it sort of collapses and all that energy gets gets smooshed into a tiny, tiny area and then it explodes with it sort of bounces is, is what you could say, but that's an understatement. Basically everything about a supernova is an understatement. It explodes with such force um, and you can definitely see it's more of explodey shaped, right? It's more, got more of a kapow sort of shape to it. Yes? Okay, so the last one looked like an eyeball. So has that not exploded yet? No, it exploded. Okay. It's just not nearly as big of an explosion as this one. It exploded, but sort of just popped like a balloon. Mm -hmm. Right? This one exploded... Like dynamite. Like dynamite, yeah. Have we ever seen a star explode in our lifetime? Um, nope. Well... Yes and no. Uh, we see, we do see supernova from distant galaxies. That's how bright they are, actually. The only time that we can see individual stars in distant galaxies is when they go supernova. So we have seen that. We have we have observed that. Um, but they don't happen too frequently. And this one happened about a thousand years ago. Uh, it happened in. The 1100s, I think, we have records from Chinese astronomers who reported a super bright star that was there for a short amount of time in the sky that was actually visible during the daytime. Um, so like during certain parts of the year that this happened, they could see the, the bright point in the star during the daytime. And at nighttime, it was like a full moon, uh, even, even when there was no moon. It was, that's how, that's how bright these things are. And this was very, very far away. And then what these ones leave behind, depending on how big it is, what they leave behind is um, a neutron star, which is, remember I talked about the white dwarf, which is very small and dense. Well, it's a lot smaller and denser than that. It's actually so, so much smaller and denser that elements don't exist. It's all just neutrons compacted together. Basically just a, a soup of, of zero charge matter that ends up being about the size of, uh, if I remember correctly, about the size of Manhattan. A large portion of the mass of a very large star compacted down to about the size of New York. Very small, very crazy. A lot of interesting things happen with gravity there. But if they're bigger than that, if, if we go even bigger, then it'll condense down into a black hole, which is another discussion entirely. We could have a whole episode eventually on black holes. But, like I said, none of the stars that we observe on a regular basis have ever undergone supernova. However, in the life cycle of a star, it reaches a certain point, and right here is the star Betelgeuse in the constellation Orion. When a star reaches a certain point in its fusion processes, that it starts fusing iron. Now what's special about fusing iron is that it consumes energy rather than releases energy. So when it starts doing that, you know that the star is dying. It's on its, it's on its death cycle. And when we say that, we're talking about like over a few hundred thousand years it's gonna die, right? But we've been observing Betelgeuse, which we know is in that stage. And it's been doing some interesting flickering, I guess you could say, um, some dimming processes that we've never observed in any star before. So it might go supernova. It's big enough to do so. Sometime, when I say soon, I'm talking on astronomical terms. So it could be tomorrow. It could be 10,000 years from now. That's about how long we think it's got, or astronomers think it's got left before it goes supernova. Now, wouldn't that be incredible, right? That's something, that's something that your grandparents never would have seen and something your grandchildren never will see if it happens today, you know? It would be the astronomical event of the lifetime.
for sure, of several lifetimes. Turn 2020 right back around. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, that's these ones, objects inside our galaxy. Now we'll turn our focus over to a few objects outside our galaxy. That is to say, other galaxies.